Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad. My name is Phil, and by now you've probably heard the news. I moved from Kentucky to Minnesota this fall. There's a couple reasons for this, the biggest being that fascist conservatives have Kentucky in a stranglehold and they're coming after queer people, pregnant people, and they're just generally focused on distracting their base from noticing all the death and destitution that their policies cause. If my daughter ever needs an abortion or turns out to be my son, they won't be safe in Kentucky as it is today. So when my wife, my wife was offered her old job in Minneapolis for more money and paid relocation, we decided to jump ship and get my daughter somewhere safer. Tonight, I want to walk you through the economics of my move. I'm going to simplify the numbers to keep things snappy because for one, I know that my situation is not the norm. Some of you are going to hate my guts when we get to the end of this thing. And secondly, the specific numbers are important to the broader point that I want to make, which is that for the average family, fleeing conservative fascism just isn't feasible most of the time. Lastly, I want to share some observations that I made during the moving process that I think anybody interested in projects of liberation or community care might find interesting. While my specific move isn't the norm, the challenges that I ran into are the norm, and I think those of us on the left can do a lot to help our friends and neighbors. So let's get into it. In 2016, my wife, my wife and I were able to buy a single family home without a down payment thanks to a new home buyers program in Kentucky. It was a three bed, three bath home, about 1,700 square feet, and we got it for around $170,000. Those of you living in Los Angeles or Seattle or New York, I'm so sorry you had to hear that. Over time, we made a few improvements to the house, new fencing, new dishwasher. Just three months ago, I had to replace the AC and the furnace for a total cost of $13,000. Thank you, easily available credit. Anyway, in July of this year, my wife, my wife got her job offer, relocation included. Her start date was mid-September. We had about six weeks to figure something out, which is a really short time in case that's not obvious. Six weeks to pack, list our house, sell it, find a new one, buy it, drive four cars 700 miles and unpack. <laughs> Fortunately, one of the lenders that we were looking at in Minnesota had a program called Buy Before You Sell. If you qualify, the bank will allow you to make a cash offer on a new home right away rather than having to wait until you sell the home you currently live in. The bank will then buy that home for you and rent it back to you until you sell your current home, at which point you give them the down payment for the new home out of the proceeds from the sale on your old home. You just have to come up with 4% of the price of the new home as earnest money to get the whole program started. So we began preparing to list our Kentucky home and we began to remotely hunt for a Minnesota house that would accommodate four adults, my in-laws live with us, a toddler, two dogs, and five cats. You see now why we couldn't just rent. On the selling side of things, I incurred several expenses getting the home ready. I paid for yard work to clear sticks and thick brush from the backyard. I paid for junk removal a couple of times. I had to put in a new floor upstairs because one of my cats peed all over it. And we spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on miscellaneous supplies like paint, stuff for packing, termite treatment, electricians, and other repairs here and there. On the relocation side of things, my wife's my wife. company allowed us to have three pairs of plane tickets for free in order to house hunt in Minnesota. They paid for movers to come pack up and haul away and store all of our stuff for a month and deliver the boxes to the new house. On the buying side of things, we narrowed our housing selection down to seven candidates we could see in a single weekend. On a whim, we visited an eighth home because we had some extra time, and wouldn't you know it, that was the perfect home. So we put in an offer, it was accepted, and I had to come up with $16,000 of earnest money within 48 hours of the accepted offer. I took $6,000 out of my savings, and I borrowed $10,000 from my dad. Bing bang boom, 21 days later, we had a new house. During that 21 day wait, we moved in with my parents since all of our stuff was in storage and we needed to keep the old house empty while it was being listed. Fortunately, my parents had enough bedrooms to accommodate all of us comfortably, and I think they enjoyed all the extra quality time with my daughter. With all this money flying out of my hands, I decided to check into one of my retirement accounts that I'd started back when I was a cop. Over the past decade, the value of that retirement account had grown quite a bit. So I decided to do a partial withdrawal since it's not my only retirement account. Dipping into this account, I was able to pay my dad back and pay off the $13,000 HVAC debt on the old house. I'll be able to pay off most of the credit card debt that we racked up, put some money back in savings, and cover any other expenses related to selling the old house. And we did finally get an offer on the old place, and if all goes according to plan, we'll end up with about $80,000 of profit from the sale of the house. Our down payment for the Minnesota home comes out to about $80,000. So we will have essentially just traded houses when all is said and done. Thanks to that early withdrawal and the relocation assistance, we should end up more or less as financially stable as we were before we started this whole process. And there you have it. That's what it took to get five people and seven animals out of Kentucky in just six weeks. So 
So if you sat through that entire presentation, a couple of things probably jumped out at you. The main thing I wanted to show you was all the upfront costs that we had to cover even as we were receiving assistance from the company and loans from family. And yes, I realize it probably also jumped out at you that I am extremely lucky in life and have access to a lot of money when I need it. You see now why I don't have a Patreon. In addition to the upfront money costs, that six weeks represented a huge cost in stress and personal exertion. Even though we had movers helping with the heavy stuff, we still had to do a lot of organizing, packing, dumping, repairing, giving away, and disassembling ourselves. My in-laws spent hours touching up paint and tidying up the lawn and the bushes around the house. My parents did a lot of babysitting and reorganizing in their own lives to accommodate five new house guests, and I still had to do my day job during all of this. So yeah, while my situation is atypical in terms of having access to the relocation assistance and loans from family and retirement accounts and all that stuff, it's also atypical in just how doable this move was for us. It was never a question that we could get to Minnesota in six weeks. It was just a question of how. And it is not like that for millions of families trapped all around the United States right now. The policies and politicians that make communities unsafe for queer, racialized, or disabled people are also the policies and politicians that attempt to keep queer, racialized, and disabled people broke and under or unemployed. Heck, even if you don't fall into this or that marginalized group, you still don't have many worker protections and you're still probably buried in debt or barely making enough to cover your bills as it is. How many workers can just fly off to another state to look for housing? How many can afford to transport all of their possessions across the country? How many have enough money saved up to float them while they hunt for a new job in a new city? When we talk about capitalism requiring a permanent underclass to exploit, this is what we're talking about. The politicians and the pundits who smugly say, well, if you don't like the way things are being run, then vote with your feet and leave, know that millions of families don't have that option. They are kept in a state of precarity precisely so they can't vote with their feet, and often, they can't even vote at all. The notions that the states are all these laboratories of democracy that will attract like-minded citizens with successful policies in the great political marketplace ignores that capitalism intentionally cheats residents out of choices through wage suppression, voter suppression, union suppression, a non-existent social safety net, non-existent disability accommodations, substandard education and vocational training, junk fees, predatory lending. Capitalism gives maximum choice to the wealthy by taking choices away from the working class and forcing them into intolerable conditions just to feed their family. Wealth is choice, and our system exists to make sure that you don't have much of either. But you didn't need me to tell you that. You already know that and you're likely already suffering under that. So what is the point of this video besides just rubbing it in your face that I'm way luckier than you? Well, something occurred to me during the hemorrhaging money portion of the move. Specifically while I was paying 1-800-GOT-JUNK $500 to haul away a bunch of crap from my garage. I'm watching these two guys throw rusty patio furniture and broken side tables into the back of a truck and I'm thinking, you know, if I had a pickup truck and a couple of friends, I could have done this myself for free. In fact, one of my neighbors recycles metal as a way to make extra cash and I let him come over and take whatever he thought he could use from my junk pile. Win-win. And it just hit me that us neighbors should be doing this kind of stuff for each other every single day. I would happily spend a couple hours tossing junk into the back of a truck for somebody else down the street if they had their own urgent move. All along my street, pickup trucks were sitting idle in driveways while some of us were paying hundreds of dollars to have a stranger show up with some other truck. Why? I spent hundreds of dollars to have an electrician come out for 10 minutes and tell me that a couple of my outlets weren't grounded properly. But there's an electrician who lives around the corner who probably would have done that for just a beer. Look, I'm a soft beta cuck soy boy who designs software for a living. So obviously I can't do everything for everyone. But in just the half mile block around my old house, we have electricians and plumbers and contractors and junk haulers, landscapers, painters, house cleaners who know how to do all kinds of things. And sometimes you just need an extra pair of hands to help haul sticks out of your backyard. And even soft beta cuck soy boys can do that. So many of the expenses related to my move did not require special skills and technical certifications. They required time, a little muscle, and some way to move things around. Really, they just required somebody to show up for me. And it just hit me anew how our society is structured in such a way that we all have to individually pay for strangers to show up for us. That there's no simple way to broadcast a need out into the community and have somebody happily swing by and donate 20 minutes of their time to save you 200 bucks. 
So here's the thing, I'm feeling some guilt about the fact that I was able to blow a bunch of money to make sure that my daughter was safe, knowing that other people's kids won't be so lucky back in Louisville. Many of the queer kids that I mentored have no way of escaping Republican extremism, and they'll be forced to either endure it or fight back at great risk to their future and to their safety. And sure, I can donate money here or there to help this or that person, to support this or that GoFundMe, but that's not a systemic solution and it doesn't scale adequately enough to rescue everyone who needs rescuing. So here's where I pull you into the mix. If you're watching this and you're any kind of fan of my channel, you're probably somebody who thinks about these issues a lot. And more importantly, you're probably somebody who cares about these issues a lot. You're somebody who sees collective action as a force for good in your community. You're somebody who sees mutual aid as a weapon against capitalist exploitation. You're somebody who knows that at the end of the day, we either survive together or not at all. So, and this is not a rhetorical question, how do we make it easier to show up for each other? How do we create communities where we all give a little to save each other a lot? How can we take advantage of economies of scale in mutual aid networks? Because the thing is, I don't know. I'm 40. I'm an indoor kid. I work from home. I take care of a toddler. And I'm tired for like 60% of my waking life. So all my thoughts turn towards technology and social media. The Nextdoor app seems like an obvious place to organize community mutual aid networks, except that these days, it's full of mostly right-wing grandpas on there complaining about teens loitering or bad service at Culver's. Could lefties take over next door and twist it towards our dark purposes? Would we even want to? Is this something we need to take to, like, a local DSA meeting? And what about the people out in the holler deep in farm country who are nowhere near organizations like that? Usually, I like to come to you with an actionable idea, but tonight, I'm coming to you as an ignorant dude who sees a problem, who sees an opportunity, but can't quite figure out how it all fits together. So you tell me, how do we show up for each other? How do we unite those with trucks with those in need of a truck? How do I donate my two hands to somebody who needs an extra pair for the afternoon? How do we get a gal who knows her way around a multimeter out to somebody with electrical trouble? How do we get a roto-rooter out to the single mom with a clogged drain? And, very importantly, how do we make sure that this system cannot be used by bad actors to harm others? How do we inoculate it against racism and ableism and sexual violence? If you could give me an answer by like the end of the week, that'd be great, thanks. No, but seriously, let me know in the comments. Does your community have a good answer for this? Do you have experience doing this? Are there any triumphs you want to brag about or cautionary tales that we need to consider? Let us know. Anyway, very glad to be back with you all. Very excited to get back to making videos. I really appreciate you joining me. I really appreciate all the kind words and good vibes that you sent me during the move. Y'all are the best. Here's to new chapters and new beginnings. Have a good night.